Welcome to a new installment of the Pharma Forum podcast. In this episode, I speak with Harriet Lewis, Director of Public Affairs and Communications at Chiesi UK and Ireland, discussing sustainability within the pharma industry and how those green ambitions can be progressed through partnering with NHS also. With Harry's previous experience at both ABPI and NICE, it is a conversation on a hot topic that is both well-informed and insightful, ranging from short-term practices to long-term requirements, including addressing waste issues, as with inhalers, injector pens and blister strips, along the recycling way. Tune in, take a listen. And send in your comments if you have any. Pharma Forum aims to bring you the stories that spark conversations, after all. And, as ever, thank you for listening. This is web editor Nicole Raleigh, and with me is Harriet Lewis, Director of Public Affairs and Communications at Chiesi UK and Ireland. Today, we will be discussing sustainable practices, and how partnerships between the NHS and the pharmaceutical industry can support the journey to these, from R&D and drug reimbursement to medicines and recycling. When people think about pharma, they often think about big pharma, impersonal, large corporations that have no consideration for sustainability. However, Chiesi is a little different. It might be large, but it considers itself a family business. Indeed, it is run by the Chiesi family. And that family business works for the benefit of the global patient community. Founded in 1935, the Chiesi group focuses on respiratory conditions, special care and rare diseases. And it has proven its dedication to global public health with its designation as a certified benefit corporation or B Corp since 2019, the first pharmaceutical company to be certified such. We might have just missed March at that time that we are speaking now, March being B Corp month after all, but nevertheless, the conversation is still of ongoing importance. The non-profit organisation B Labs issues B Corp certifications to businesses that can demonstrate a positive social and environmental impact, as well as make certain public commitments to accountability and transparency. But before we begin to discuss the general transition within industry to greener research and developments, Harriet, perhaps you could tell listeners a little bit about your own journey to today, your background and the passions followed and the pathways travelled to your work with Chiesi. I mean, I believe you were previously at the Association of the British Pharmaceutical Industry or ABPI, as well as the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. Yes, and hello. Um, That's right. I I was previously with both of those organisations, but actually prior to that, my my origins stem from being a pharmacist. So I trained as a pharmacist, I qualified as a pharmacist, um, and I worked as a pharmacist for many years. And I worked in community pharmacy, so directly with patients and also in hospital pharmacy, Um, at the sort of early part of my career. I then moved to, I had the opportunity to move into more sort of policy related work with Trafford Primary Care Trust. Uh, They were called PCTs, Primary Care Trust at the time. Um, And I was the, um, I was the lead for uh, pharmacy services, community pharmacy services. And it was there actually that I developed a um, a very strong interest in public health. And I actually took um, an additional qualification in public health and the role of pharmacy and medicines in public health. And that's really been the the basis of my my passions. My passions are about patients, are about patient care, patient health. I'm a bit of a stick of rock really. You can if you cut through me you'll find uh, you know what's by, what's best for the patient running right th- right through me. And I was also quite heavily involved in introducing the electronic prescription service, which is a national service. And now most prescriptions, most repeat prescriptions are delivered through that service. But at Trafford, we were one of the pioneer sites and I was leading that programme. So I had through that work, I had uh, you know, a great insight into um, the workings of national government and the NHS as it was at the time, the national NHS at the time. Um, and also, as I, as I say, with public health and what's um, what's in the best interest of the populations as well in the country. 
And from there, I moved to uh, NICE um, and I was Associate Director of Policy and Implementation. So I was involved in writing guidelines for local decision making and area prescribing committees who are making decisions about local formularies. I was also involved in some work with the Department of Health at the time on controlled drugs policies, which was as a consequence of um, the shipment in- or the, the various shipment inquiries. So um, that's really the the basis for my my love of policy, which might sound a bit strange, but yeah, I do love policy. And then at ABPI, my role was at the interface between industry or companies and the NHS. So I was an engagement partner and very much about encouraging the NHS to work closely with companies to find those areas where companies can collaborate, whether it be multiple companies or individual companies, and finding those areas where we could collaborate together in the best interest of patients and also transform um, ensuring that medicines reach the right patients as well. So public health and health equity are very, really very important to me. Um, and I'm pleased to say that they're very important to Chiesi as well. So I came to Chiesi in 2018, and there I've been able to sort of follow through on my passions for um, for health equity and sustainability. Within Chiesi, we have a mission of shared value, and shared value means using our business, our prosperity as a force for good for both our, uh, well, for our patients, but also for our people. And that includes our, the community around us as well, and also the planet. So we firmly believe in using our business in a way that supports those three components, our patients, our people, and our planet. And making sure that we we do everything we can. So we don't, our, all our policies, all our work programs, put the patients at the centre. Lots of companies say they are patient-centric. But I firmly believe that the way we've um, we've established Kiesi in the with shared value and sustainability at the heart of what we do, we genuinely do put the patient at the centre of our work programmes. Thank you for that, Harriet. Yes, as you say, it's about the best interests of the population, that triumvirate, if you will, of patients, people and planet. That is why this focus on sustainability is so important at the moment. So if we turn now to carbon offsetting and reducing industry's environmental footprint, the 2022 report supporting the era of green pharmaceuticals in the UK, published by the Office of Health Economics or OHE and commissioned by the ABPI, highlighted that While the UK can play a leading role in the sustainability agenda for pharmaceuticals, actions must also be global to ensure impact, estimating that the share of health service carbon emissions attributable to pharmaceuticals varies from 12% to 35% as different studies take different measures of the NHS carbon footprint as the total. Indeed, the report shows that companies face five key challenges in the drive for net zero those being safety, regulatory standards, low success rates in pharmaceutical R&D, the changing nature of innovation, and the fact that healthcare systems do not currently reward sustainability. So I was wondering if you could comment on that. Yes, um, I'm very familiar with that report. Actually, I was on the one of the working groups that um, supported the development of that report. And I think the, the challenges are very well articulated. But I, what I would also say uh, at Chiesi, we have uh, a long term and far reaching global approach to reducing our carbon footprint. And whilst offsetting is a is a relevant activity, a relevant um, activity that we do now, it is in the short term and it is part of how we are going to reduce part of our scope one, scope two and scope three emissions. But in the longer term, it's really about changing the way we manufacture our products, how we conduct our clinical trials and how we innovate our products um, that will actually be the the, the main drivers for how we will reduce uh, our carbon impact on the environment. And our plans have to be global. We are a global company. Uh, We are in a global industry. So whatever we do in the UK is very important, very relevant, but we have to think globally. So our global company has to adopt a uh, an approach that is relevant for all the countries that we operate in. And we have to be ambitious. Absolutely, we have to be ambitious. 
But we also have to be transparent and we have to be held accountable for um, what we say we're going to do. And we we believe in action over words. And we also have to be measurable. So we, we have to have a mechanism for measuring what we do and then being able to test whether we've actually achieved it or not. And B Corp, actually being a B Corp is a really important part of our whole programme because B, B Corp provides us with that measurement framework that we do use and we will be using. And it's um, it, it gives us a, an improvement plan for our continuous improvement philosophy and ac- activities. Um, we also see a huge opportunity in the in innovation in our business. So what's right for our patients is that we innovate to make sure that our products are actually fit for purpose and fit for the future. So we've made very significant investments in our development program to make sure that we are innovating and we're bringing products to market that are, are have as low a carbon footprint as, as is humanly possible, but also that they meet the the needs of our patients. And also, it's not just about our, our products, but it's also how we manufacture our products. It's also about how we operate our businesses and using all the various energy reduction opportunities as well that that um, we can find. We need to, uh, I suppose, what, what concerns me, and it comes back to the report really, is that there are significant challenges along the way. We We need to be encouraged to do this as a as an industry as a whole industry Chiesi, we're doing this anyway but as a whole industry we need to be encouraged we need to be incentivized because a lot of these innovations don't come cheap we have to put a lot of money behind them a lot of investment and we would like to see some um some more encouragement from government to help us in this direction uh, we look across at other industries where other industries are incentivized to um, accelerate their rate of change And we would like to see similar sort of uh, encouragements as well. What we've also got playing sort of in parallel to our ambitions is the the environment in which we're operating in. And we've recently, you'd be familiar, we've recently, um, the ABPI has recently negotiated a payment structure with with government, which is the Voluntary Scheme for Branded Medicines Pricing Access and Growth, so VPAG as we know it. And whilst VPAG is uh, intended to be pro-innovation, what we're finding is that the definition of innovation doesn't include green innovation. And we believe there needs to be a, a consideration for broadening the definition of innovation so that we can, we as companies can be encouraged and rewarded and our products can be recognised for the innovations that they are and that we can bring them to patients as quickly as possible. Thank you for all that, Harriet. I just want to unpack some of what you said because there's a broad remit there. So if we stick with what you've just mentioned about VPAG, talking about sustainable practices more generally across the industry and within the NHS, the Royal Pharmaceutical Society wrote that it's important that the positive changes to patient care and pharmacy practice that were made in response to COVID-19 are retained and built upon, and that patient experience must continue to be improved whilst protecting the future sustainability of the NHS. And VPAG has been agreed, as you stated, and will run for five years until the 31st of December 2028. And you've just mentioned then that it does not allow for or contain within it wording for green innovation. So I was just wondering if you could perhaps broaden out on why that's so important in respect of facilitating, easing the challenges for industry to become more sustainable. Yes. So the 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 challenges that we face are the same as many companies will face when they're innovating a new product. We have to run um, clinical trials. We have to have a whole development program. We have to uh, make sure that the product is safe and effective. And we have to send, it has to pass all the necessary safety and regulatory barrier challenges to bring it to market. And they are, there is a, a package of work that can last some considerable time and bringing products to market can take a, a very long time because of the the various sort of failures along the way and also as i say the the regulatory routes so with that comes cost significant cost and resources um so vpag recognizes innovation that is in effect sort of new and they recognize new molecules but where a product is 
has innovated, where a company has innovated, but using the same molecules, they are not being rewarded for the innovation that they're going to bring to market. And the innovation in this, in the case of Chiesi, where we're in respiratory and we manufacture inhalers, the innovation that we will be bringing will have such a significant impact on the NHS's carbon footprint. The NHS has been very vocal and, and uh, very open in their, with their publication of their net zero targets. And they've said quite categorically that inhalers play an important part in achieving their net zero targets. And we want to play our part in that in helping the NHS to achieve those. So we're bringing a product to market that will support the NHS to achieve net zero, UK government to achieve net zero. So there is a, a demand from within the system. We want patients to have choice. We want patients to still have access to the medicines that they need. And these, most of these medicines are they're treating uh, conditions that could potentially be life-threatening. So we want to make sure that we get the product to the patients as soon as possible and also address the climate issue. So within VPAG, there is no recognition for the extent of the investment that's needed to bring the product to market. And yet, if you had, uh, if a company has a new molecule, there is recognition and reward within that. So that's the that's where we sort of have um, a concern about the way um, innovation has been defined. Thank you. And indeed, you in particular, Harriet, you're very passionate about this area. I mean, you're a founding member of the Circularity and Primary Pharmaceutical yes. Packaging Accelerator, yes. and you yourself pioneered the first ever postal inhaler recycling scheme in the UK, didn't you? Um, we did. Um, and I'll, I'll just put some context to uh, why we did the in recycling scheme. So um, a little bit of sort of going back a little bit in in 2018, um, the Environmental Audit Committee, the UK Parliament uh, Committee, published a report that highlighted the, the challenge of the propellants that are in inhalers now, in metered dose inhalers. And the Environmental Audit Committee actually identified the waste element of inhalers as a significant problem because inhalers, when they're no longer needed or used, actually most people will put them in their domestic refuse bin in their kitchen bin and the audit committee highlighted this as a significant problem because they believe not only did the propellant leak into the atmosphere and it has a high global warming potential but also there's a lot of plastic that is going to landfill as well so we um we knew that there was a a definite need to do something to mobilize patients to encourage patients to do something all community pharmacies accept waste but actually, the research we did showed that um, a lot of people don't take their inhalers back to their pharmacies. They were putting them basically through their domestic waste. So we we knew that something needed to be done as a matter of urgency. We have a um, we have a development program for the inhalers to transition to low global warming potential propellants. But in the meantime, we knew we had to do something about the waste, and that was the that was the really behind uh, and certainly my passion about. Um, how we could uh, encourage patients to do something with their inhalers rather than putting them into the domestic waste. So that was why we set up the postal scheme. We did we did a lot of research. We did a lot of uh, market research asking patients, what do they want? What do they know? What do they understand? And the outcome was that they want it to be easy. They want it to be close to home and uh, they wanted it to be anonymous as well. So uh, that's why we set up the postal scheme. And I'm absolutely delighted the postal scheme has actually won uh, quite a number of awards now for being quite innovative and really sort of um, setting down, being a bit trailblazing for uh, how recycling of medicines could actually be done. And on the back of that, through lots of conversations with people, the Consortium of uh, Circularity in Primary Pharmaceutical Packaging, SIPA, was born. And the reason it was born was because Companies like us knew we recognise very quickly and there are other companies with other products where they're also trying to tackle the same issue. We know we can't do it alone. Um, we have to do it together and we have to do it with the NHS, with the system and with patients as well. 
there are examples of where companies have tried to do it alone and it just we just don't get the we don't get the volumes back to make it um really meaningful so in order to get the volumes and in order to get the um the mobilization that we need of all the people in the whole value chain we've come together so I, I'm really proud of of SIPA. I'm proud to be a found, founding member. And we have three work streams, actually. We have inhalers and we also have injector pens, plastic injector pens and blister packs, blister strips, of which there are multiple millions of those that are that go into landfill every year. So it's very much about trying to cover all the different pharmaceutical packaging that are hard to recycle and cause problems. Yes, I mean, it's a massive issue. And there you go, listeners. Harriet is an established expert in sustainability. So if we turn now, Harriet, to your work with Chiesi, what can you tell us about Chiesi's own sustainability initiatives, including green manufacturing and indeed inhaler recycling projects? I mean, Chiesi UK's respiratory portfolio is carbon neutral, I believe. And there was, of course, its 350 million euro investment in developing the first low carbon inhaler to treat respiratory conditions. Can you tell us more? Yes. So as I've, as I've said, we, we operate on a principle of shared value. And shared value to us means doing the right thing, using our business as a, as a force for good. And that means that we've taken a very bold approach um, and very robust approach to our net, our carbon reduction targets. And we are committed to reaching net zero by 2035. Um, and we have been a B Corp, as, a, as we've already mentioned, since 2019. Uh, we have invested really heavily into the sustainability programme. And as you've mentioned, we've invested 350 million euros to deliver the carbon minimal inhaler programme. And that aligns with our sustainability goals and on our initiatives for helping patients and the planet. And we aim to support innovation through this positive change. The carbon minimal inhaler will actually bring about a 90% reduction in our carbon footprint. So that's our part of our scope three emissions. But we also have ambitious pro, an ambitious programme to reduce our scope one and our scope two emissions as well. So these are all part of the programme. We report our targets through the science-based target initiatives. And we also use, as I've said, we use um, B Corp as our uh, ongoing continuous improvement measurement tool. We we do believe that we can't do this in isolation. We believe that it's uh, incumbent on us to encourage to to lead the way and encourage our own suppliers to do the same. So where we're innovating and striving to improve our impact on the environment, we expect our suppliers to do the same. So what we've done is a number of years ago, 2019 also, uh, we co-created, our global procurement team co-created with a um, a whole number of suppliers, a a code of interdependence. And that code of interdependence is uh, the, the bedrock for our relationship with our suppliers. We now use a platform called the Ecovardis platform, where we request all our suppliers to provide their sustainability information through that platform. So we are developing that. We, in fact, we're um, we're moving forward with that to the point where we'll be actually doing a an assessment of our supply. So at the moment, we're just asking them to report. We will be moving to a point where we are requesting we will assess them, and if our suppliers are not meeting the standards that we re- we require, we will obviously then need to have conversations with them, take steps. Either they put in place an improvement plan. Or if it means that we no longer work with a particular supplier, then that might actually be the case as well. So we believe firmly that we can't do this on our own and we re- we require our suppliers to do the same. And interestingly, um, the NHS is doing the same to us, is requesting the same of us. So we work with the NHS through their um, evergreen supplier framework. And uh, we were part of their pilot, actually. So it's an important piece of work for us that we do. We demonstrate to the NHS that we are a responsible supplier 
And we provide the information they've requested through Evergreen, the assessment framework. And also we've now published a carbon reduction plan, again, uh, sort of in partnership with the NHS, following uh, their requirements for what they want to see from their suppliers. So it goes right down the whole supply chain. And um, I believe that's a, a real it's a demonstration of shared value by doing it that way. Yes, as you say, shared values, partnership, collaboration, not being able to do it alone. If we think of the future now with these shared values and these shared tangible actions being taken, where do you see as well as where do you hope the pharmaceutical industry and the NHS will be in terms of sustainable practices by 2030 and even 2050, say? Yes, I... um, It's a big question. (laughs) It it is a a big question. (laughs) What do I hope for? I I hope that other companies, all companies, follow suit. We we have a man, we have a belief, a philosophy in Chiesi, um of action over words. So we publish what we're going to do. We're transparent. We expect to be measured, and we expect to be held to account. I don't necessarily see that in all companies. I think there can be examples of companies who will publish what they what their targets are, but don't actually move forward with those targets. So it I believe it's uh, I would want to see Kiesi take that leadership role and hold others to account. So where we where we all need to move to, we all need to be moving in the same direction. We all need to be demonstrating that we are responsible suppliers to the NHS and that the NHS can rely on us and can trust us to be those responsible suppliers. And in return, I suppose I would expect the NHS, uh, as as I've already mentioned through VPAG, that um, there is recognition and reward. Um, And also with UK government as well. So not just with the pricing mechanism, but with UK government as well. There have been some conversations started with NICE about how sustainability can be integrated into some of the health technology appraisal processes. So that's a, that's a, a complex area and something that it's very, very heartwarming to see NICE is starting that journey. Similarly, with the MHRA, the regulator, um, I'd like to see the regulator uh, also sort of take account of the innovations, the the green innovations, so that companies are confident that products can move through the system uh, as efficiently as possible. And just generally the the policy landscape where possible to be as favourable as it can be to reward green innovation and encourage green manufacturing processes and the encouragement for continuous improvement. As an industry, I think we're moving in the right direction. I think ABPI are being, you know, a bit, big shout out for my ex-colleagues. I think they are being excellent in really trying to position the industry well. I chair the sustainability working group um, and we get uh, excellent attendance all the time. Companies are always are looking to learn from each other, which is a really, really healthy way of doing it that we share we're in a non-competitive space and we share best practice so that we can all move in in that direction. Absolutely. I think you've you've summarized it well. You've set out a horizon which is very much needed in the tomorrow. So targets and talk are not enough. Actions over words together for a sustainable future. Thank you very much, Harriet. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And so that concludes another episode of the Pharma Forum podcast. You can find out more information about this episode, including a download link and information about previous installments of the series at pharmaforum.com forward slash podcasts. The Pharma Forum podcast is also available on iTunes, Spotify, Acast, Stitcher and Podbean where you can find and subscribe by searching for Pharma Forum. Of course, don't forget to visit our website itself, where you can sign up for daily news and analysis bulletins and follow us on Twitter, or X nowadays, at at Pharma Forum. That's all for now. Thank you for listening.